I found it. It's Proverbs 25, 17. It reads, I've got the King James Version right now. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be wary of thee and so hate thee. Let's say that again. Proverbs 25, 17. Withdraw thy foot from thy neighbor's house, lest he be wary of thee and so hate thee. Yeah, Satan is like that neighbor. And you see here in the Proverbs, it is described that you should be the one to exercise discretion to not be that thing to a person. Don't be that guy to that girl. Don't be that girl to that guy. Don't be that girl to that girl and that guy to that guy. Don't be that neighbor. Yeah. But you see, Satan has no respect, neither any regard, even in the slightest for, you know, respect of code, human code, like human relationships, code therein. How to be NJ, how to be cordial, how to be neighborly, how to be collegial, how to be human. Yeah, the devil is all about respecting, disrespecting everything, bending every rule in the book. If he can tarnish it, he is tarnishing it. All right. The devil is all about that business of having no respect. So he will grab all the pet peeves of humanity and he will bring them all up in your grill until you feel like there's no way out. I'll never be okay out of this this is not gonna end well there is no way under heaven that i am ever gonna get any peace out of here so it looks like capitulation is the only thing that i gotta do the devil works on human um exhaustion he 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 thrives on human capitulation like w when people just settle thank you well, when they settle when, when they accept the status quo he has won because he knows that he can't actually really truly take from a person that has put their foot down and has said no not on my watch i'm not doing this yeah you are not going to stay yeah you see herein lies the creation account that horrible though like in the in the before we even get the creation account in the example of cassandra the racist white neighbor and then uh jumaima dealing with pinky the new black neighbor that she now prefers yeah by the end of your life you will wish that you had cassandra back that's what i'm getting at by the end of your experiences as a psychopathic witch you will wish that you could bring cassandra back or that you could go back to the good old-fashioned days of cassandra because cassandra was not the best of people do you understand she wasn't but she was not the tick in your hair that caused you to want to throw your page out the window mm. You just had um, disagreements. As neighbors, you did not like each other because you're sinners and you had loggerheads with each other thanks to your, you know, uh, what you call this, like individual unique biases that dwell inside your hearts. That's why you and Cassandra can't stand each other. Man is made for adversity. That's what is written in God's word. We are born dead in trespasses and sins and instances that our parents conceive us. All we can do is just sin. So Cassandra out here manufactures the sin of racism while you manufacture the sin of unforgiveness and also the sin of once cassandra has dealt you a bad blow sufficiently you then decide that revenge is what you're going to do to cassandra so you repay evil for evil you repay cassandra's evil for evil and in so using evil in order to deal with cassandra you then are met with pinky you're met with the buzzing bee the buzzing see the fly the the pestilent bug in your ecosystem that just won't go until you will you miss like you will literally end up missing Cassandra, like when something was was the bane of your existence before and now you miss it, you know you've dropped the ball. People in the occult always end up missing simplicity. The simplicity of the modes and the ebbs and the flows of human, human existence as they progress through life. The ups and the downs, the peaks and the troughs, the disappointments and the gladnesses, the joys and the sorrows. Just enduring them because that's how we are made to experience the earth. Ever since Adam and Eve fell, there would inevitably be sorrow in our lives. Man is now made for adversity because we, we turned our, way, our hearts away from God. We sinned. And so there is striving between us now. There is division. There is no peace. Um, and because there is no peace, we are implored by God to be mature about it, to not repay evil for evil to turn the other cheek blah blah all that jazz so essentially you know the bible also says a gentle answer turns away wrath a gentle answer turns away wrath so instead of yelling and bickering with a person that's bickering at you when you say i'm sorry they 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 they, they, they you know they track back they relax they when you choose your battles that's what i'm getting at your life turns out all right 
in the end hey like in the, in the grand scheme of things like overall i've lived a good life you know i've got like yeah fine so i've had road rage incidents indeed i have had uh you know what do you call this um I, i've been i've had i've had indiscretions slap me from people who are racist i have uh had breakups makeups i've had friends that betrayed me and others that stayed uh, you know on a balance really of eventualities yeah it turned out all right yeah that best friend that i lost in high school because she passed me shade and thought that i was now not in her league anymore because i was starting to get pimples mm, it worked out all right because good riddance like frankly you know she was toxic anyway uh, now i've got like three best friends and we're good we're good i didn't need pinky i didn't need the i didn't need kinele but it hurt so badly at the time that you wanted revenge kinele how dare you leave me as a friend for coming for for breaking out into acne i'm just a teenager for crying out loud yeah at the time it's raw at the time when it's happening it's steep it's hard knock it's intense but after 10 years you see how petty that kinele was and how frankly it was good riddance because who in the world wants to be with somebody that shallow anyway for a friend people move on they move on they move on but when you take matters into your own hands and you repay evil with evil and you uh, justify uh, in your own capacity without waiting for god to justify that's when you end up missing proper every nasty thing that you experienced that you let go you miss those days you miss the the simplicity of crying when somebody cuts you off in traffic and that's all you do and then you're recovering as the day progresses you miss the simplicity of being like Mah! when cassandra's archer telling you that your music is too african and too black for her to take in her stride when she's parking her car you miss the, the reaction of just being like oh, oh racist woman and then you go in your house and you bang your door but after two hours you have forgotten about it you're not watching a movie on netflix and it's like nothing ever happened you forget about it you you forget you miss the simplicity of crying over a guy that dumped you and just mourning over ice cream for like three months following which you moved on and look now you're married to somebody else you miss the simplicity of letting jabu go after he dumps you over text because now every new jabu that comes into your space you bewitch them into oblivion because they dumped you over text you are full of revenge i apologize you are full of ungodly revenge yeah vengeance in and of itself the seeking out after after it is not problematic righteous indignation is from god why because god hates unequal skills in and of himself he hates that which is crooked he does not like it when people do the most do you understand what i'm saying mm. so when you are upset and you want recalibration of scales you do you do not do a wrong thing you don't what is wrong is when you take matters into your own hands and you try to correct the situation by yourself in your sinful state in so doing it's written in god's word that when it comes to um dealing with people's issues around you you do best to check out the log in your eye before you take out the plank out of somebody else's eye right so when you respect the principle of vengeance is of the lord do not repay evil for evil you have respect for the fact that you've got a, a log in your eye in and of yourself you are problematic in and of yourself you do stuff to people that is unseemly in and of yourself you are rottenness in bones in and of yourself you are putrefaction in and of yourself you've got a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked in and of yourself have got righteous works that are like filthy rags you are a flagrant hypocrite therefore on that day when you decide to take matters into your own hands because chances are you've got never mind one log in your eye but like a whole chunky tree it's just sitting there right but you want to take out planks out of people's eyes yeah your intent to neutralize everyone that's ever broken you then using dark arts using black magic using any means necessary is like the tenement of you having two chunky trees in both your eyes with you out here walking around with a celebre to try and get rid of a the plank in other people's eyes you are using your own methods to deal with that which god said if you leave it to me i got you if you leave a vengeance to me i got you your righteous indignation is rightly placed but it is wrongly affected when you do things in your own capacity when you take matters into your own hands you're problematic on that day yeah god says it he makes it clear he is stuck with that information uh-huh and with the level of crystal clarity that you have concerning what god would have you do and you don't do it anyway because your conscience also speaks volumes to you you then on that day are without excuse to claim that but like cassandra was was um racist that's why i bewitched her what in the world and the, you bewitched cassandra for being racist all up in your girl 
only for you to invite a pinky force in your space. Something that you feel as if though is the biggest solution to your issues. Herein lies a black person moving into my neighborhood. And so I'm going to give her a casserole. And you relate with her based on her being black. And she is the solution to your racist neighbor's issues, right? The two of y'all gossip about racist white neighbors all around you and what have you until this person becomes a snare. The devil is the thing that never leaves. When you go to him for a solution, he never leaves. And people in the occult, I will say this time and time again, you, uh, you invite satan in a lot of times because of your past hurt hurt people hurt people and then when things get too extreme and too dire you then on that day are like um ish like yes like it but like mm, no this thing like it makes me want to sell my house so i can move because he's a bugaboo a bugaboo the devil does not leave unless you tell him to get the step in satan has been throughout the ages pretty much trying to get people to see where he is coming from right we as as the human race god made our this planet for us he gave us the earth right he made it and said it is good and then he formed us he fashioned us he breathed into man and he became a living soul after fashioning him from the dust of the earth adam from his rib then he fashioned eve and he said ah this at last is bone of my bone flesh of my flesh men and women here it is that they're existing on earth in total peace and harmony with god until of course they fall apart but why did adam and eve fall apart god made the earth for us to enjoy it to fill it to occupy it right um to live at peace with harmoniously with flora and fauna with animals and plant life all that jazz right just enjoy this tranquil beautiful amazing place that he made that he in and of himself called good that is now groaning because we fell apart okay and adam and eve were not demon possessed as at the time of being tempted they were not demon possessed like listen it is written in god's word that god does not tempt anybody because in and of himself he cannot be tempted but we upon chasing after our own desires then go on right ahead to fall into these temptations desire when it is conceived brings about sin and sin when it is fully grown brings about death i already explained explained in one of my other videos that desire in and of itself is not problematic it is when in the interests of this desire you do whatever it takes to get it that is problematic right so sexual desire is not problematic desire for success not problematic desire for a husband is not problematic desire for i said i mentioned success basically whatever it is that you can desire and there's not whatever okay there are some desires that are just evil there are some desires that are fetishistic and the the, the stuff of wickedness right but a lot m many of the desires of the human being are for the just embitterment like the improvement of their lives the quality of their lives right they desire them that their lives might be improved in this fashion so you desire for intimacy in a romantic union with a significant other you desire prosperity job satisfaction all that jazz these things are not problematic but when then you manufacture ill-gotten gain to acquire them that's when it becomes problematic desire brings about sin and when it is conceived brings about sin not all the time and sin when it is fully grown then uh, graduates to death the wages of sin is death but the free gift of god is eternal life for they who are in christ jesus okay yeah so uh just to help you understand even further that desire is not in and of himself in and of itself problematic it is written in god's word that commit your desires your ways to the lord sorry commit your ways to the lord and he will give you the what desires of your heart delight yourself in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart all right um he says that if you want something if you desire something ask him and he'll, he'll provide for you press down shaking together and running over if you give it'll be given back to you if you ask you will receive if you knock the door will be opened um you must be patient wait on the lord for all of this answered prayer right the pagans need these things but seek ye first the kingdom and its righteousness and all of these things will be added to you desire in and of itself is not problematic desire becomes problematic when it manufactures sin desire when it is given to god is like a fire in a fireplace i've already used this analogy before it warms the an entire house in winter and it's all comfortable because it is ensconced it is contained in a safe environment and it therefore the heat coming there therefore out of it is, is warming but desire that is apart from the will of god is more like burning a curtain it, you know the same um element that is fire is not destructive it is not healing it is this it, it rinse 
it decimates it mows down to the ground when desire is not in a fireplace it destroys the human being but when it is in a fireplace it blesses the human being richly god provides for us everything we need like i said uh press down shaking together and running over but what i wanted to say is neither eye has seen nor ear heard nor mind conceived the things which god has prepared for those who what wait for him and those who wait on the lord will do what renew their strength mount up with wings like eagles walk and not grow weary run and not faint that is what is written in god's word about a well-contained desire but a desire that is out of whack is a desire that's going to burn down a house because you're burning you're literally putting a match stick next to a curtain it's going to bring the entire structure down and god says that when you have these desires in your heart and you don't contain them in a fireplace i don't eat pray to me and wait on me you then are going to burn an inferno in your house and then when it's all the way down burnt you are literally going to bash your fist at me mankind you're silly you're gonna say but god if you're so good why did you let this happen to me you did not contain your desires in me you did not contain it in the fireplace that i am you did not seek me for answered prayer that i might one day in due season after you have collected wood and coal burn the fire i was going to be the one to light that fireplace that, that that fire in the fireplace and then your whole house was going to be warmed in winter but you don't want to wait you did not want to collect the firewood and you did not want to collect the coal you don't want to wait you just went on right ahead and continued to just switch on a lighter in a house burning some curtains and some couches some yeah that's why now you've got all the problems that you've got out here in these streets do you understand mm. so god does mm, 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 this thing yeah there we go restoration god does not tempt anybody because in and of himself he cannot be tempted we know that that's true look at what happened in the wilderness with christ uh where the devil was trying to tempt him and he was like jump off a cliff and trust the angels of god to catch you um turn this stone into some bread um worship me and i'll give you the desire the, the, the kingdoms of this world <coughs> sorry and and christ responded by saying well with with um jump off the cliff and, and trust the angels to catch you for it is written that they will bear you up in their wings and so uh, uh the, the angels of the lord will be charged concerning you and they will bear you up in their hands so that you don't strike your foot against the stone the response of jesus was man what is this um thou shalt not test the lord your god and then there with the turning of stone into bread he was like the man does not live by bread alone but by the word that proceeds from the mouth of god and with the one where it is that he was told asked to worship um satan and he will give him the desires of, of his heart basically like you know the kingdoms of this world christ was like thou shalt have no other gods but the one true right god Christ was tempted in all ways and yet did not sin. That's what the Bible has to say. And those tests in the wilderness were only but a few um, in comparison to all of them. He was tested many more ways in his whole tenure as um, um, as a human being living in these streets. Uh, but those three tests are the ones that especially stick out in the scriptures because, you know, they're the ones that we know of um, as Satan's brazen uh, deliberate attempt to cause God himself to fall apart. Right. That's what's good. Yeah. Mm so seeing as christ has displayed that his word is true when he was walking these streets and that the devil tempted him in all ways and yet he did not sin right yeah um we therefore cannot say when we are going through nonsense and a heavy amount of it and that that god has tempted us because in and of himself he cannot be tempted all right but we do have desires that we just chase after and then conceive sin and then afterwards if we don't repent it then manu it, it graduates to height of death we end up enduring ultimately what would be called the second death where the worm dieth not it's the lake of fire right uh these these dead deeds that we walk in ultimately putrefy us to the nth degree until we enter into molten lava for all of eternity mm. but god it is written in his word that he is he remain he he has compassion on us as human individuals that's what's good he remembers that we are made of dust and so he has compassion on us so because the lord knows that we are made of dust that we are born dead in trespasses and sins ever since adam and eve fell um we just can't do anything right yeah he then of course then has compassion in that even though he in and of himself cannot be tempted so he never ever throws us into any temptation when we are tempted he will always give us a louver of escape a way out like some piercing um in in this dark room that's going to put that, that's going to uh, uh, pierce through some kind of light that you might be able to bear up under it the lord will always give you a way out of a temptation situation he's not going to just leave you burning in a hotness that is not going to cease um without you having any kind of escape route it might be hard and a lot of times the escape route is always hard right it's always the path of most resistance it is rough to run out of a burning building with the 
you know, um, demarcated directions given you by God to get out of it instead of just basically jumping out of that building from like the 14th story, trusting that the ground is going to become marshmallow and you not die. When you are given a longer route to escape something, but it is a guaranteed way out, it's harder to take. It's easier to think that God is just, you can just jump out of a building and either the, the ground is going to turn to mush. You, you, you could believe that, but a rational mind tends to know that this is not going to end well and yet follows after that pursuit anyway. Rational minds have got enough going for themselves with enough factors influencing a circumstance with the outcomes being predictably a particular way for them to choose right even in the midst of pressure you you know what what can end badly and what is going to end better but you also know distance versus displacement distance versus displacement people will any minute now always choose displacement over distance no not sorry uh, they will always choose yeah displacement over um distance right distance is how long it takes to basically get to where you need to get but displacement is the distance between point a and point z without taking into consideration the turns the corners the peaks and the troughs the hills and the valleys you the yeah the the, the, the longness of the journey people would much rather avoid it and they want to fly over like taking a proper like a, an air that the best example to explain distance versus displacement is like an airplane versus driving right like when you drive to cape town you have to take all those routes and you know turns and robots and stops and whatnot but when you fly there it takes only like an hour hour and a half maybe two hours tops really on a bad day um to get all the way to cape town whereas it takes a good eight hours no 14 like 16 hours to go from johannesburg to cape town uh, yeah when you're driving like driving is the distance displacement is the airplane when you don't have an airplane to take and the lord is telling you you're gonna have to take a 16 hour drive so sleep well the night before and uh, do a layover like sleep somewhere like you know in the middle b and b halfway between johannesburg and cape town and then you will ultimately arrive in cape town just the onerous laborious just tedious process of driving all the way there is is the thing that causes people to choose displacement even when it's impossible as at present right they will continue to choose the displacement route to get there the fastest when it has been communicated to them by god that in this instance displacement is not going to work for you because you are like ibrahim raisi all right you're dealing with a helicopter that has got a whole bunch of uh, flaws in it it is old it's ancient it's got bad parts and it's not safe to fly and you get on that airplane anyway because you want to get there as quickly as possible instead of going via the long laborious onerous route of getting in an, um, a vehicle and driving your stututu your your little skudonki your little nanana all the way to cape town even though it's coughing up exhaust fumes it is guaranteed to safely get you there ultimately yeah mm -hmm. that whole onerous long route to get there is boring um tedious you know laborious by people and how tiresome it is for them just fathoming it is what causes human individuals out here in these streets to literally take a risk like Ibrahim Raisi and get on a helicopter that's going to end their lives get on a helicopter that God has warned you there are many toils and snares in there but I have already come when I take what the car the nanana take the nanana because that's a guaranteed way out that is the louver and the, the thing about that those louvers right of um e exit like those those things that go the way out that God gives tends to be so obviously the most secure uh, point of action the most secure course of action it tends to be so obviously the most secure po course of action that when people finally look back at now the ramifications they've endured as a result of displacement over distance right when they look back they have a severity of regret in thinking i, sh I should have gone to cape town using my stututu or my nanana even though it was going to take forever in a day because it was the safest route but i wanted to cut corners and i wanted to take that risk i was gambling and look at now the ramifications there, there is just an, an awareness as at the time of temptation alongside once the ramifications have been experienced born yeah there is a recognition of the fact that i knew a better way out i knew the only way out the lord will always give us a way out when we are tempted so that we can bear up under it but it tends to be like i said the path of most resistance it is not the path of least resistance it is more like distance as opposed to displacement um and most people very frankly don't take it the bible says that uh people who have um 
chased after riches and wealth will have, you know, they, they throw themselves into many temptations. We are the ones that throw ourselves astray. We chase after desires, okay? Our desires in and of themselves, not problematic, okay? They are problematic, however, however when we don't put them in a fireplace, when we, when we don't invest in firewood and coal and we forgot to light the match. Mm. When we don't wait for God to light the match, that's when things just kind of go awry. Do you understand what I'm saying? Very well and very pro uh, uh, properly. Mm. Yeah, that's that's uh, what's good. So, seeing as people don't want to take the way out, now that you're in the heat of the moment, now that you're in the center of some inferno, this is when now you unfortunately owe human beings. Hey, people, what's going on with you though? Mm? This is when you need such extreme deliverance. Oh, guys. This is when you start to need such extreme deliverance that now you're starting to get all scratched and stuff. Beaten to a pulp, hey? Hospitalized and stuff. Put on a drip. That's now when you start to go for remission because of cancer, hey? Now we gotta put you on chemotherapy. What's going on? Now you have got such a spread tumor that it's gonna take so much more to get you delivered. It's gonna take so much more to get you delivered. And I'm trying to create a case for the lost, of course, because of course you are lost, but you're super lost. Um, more so than most people, because you you've got so many demons in your bodies that they are making they have set you up for failure. We are born dead in trespasses and sins, but hello, there's good news. We 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 deliver these good news with our beautiful shoes. Okay? We we got fly shoes. In, in, in these kingdom streets we, we got fly shoes you know what i mean we've got beautiful feet and we try to deliver the gospel shoes the gospel news so they threw these fly feet and uh but they're they severely rejected people keep on stepping on them toes of, the, of them fly feet because of the fact that the devil's in you yes like it but the way they zonder god yo they will make you zonder him inordinately in a way that you never used to zonder god like you didn't have all that much beef with christ when you were a kid when you were 17 when you were 27 you weren't all that hateful i mean fine you were not born again but you were not out here blurting out sacrilegious obscenities blaspheming the god of heaven doing everything in your power to debunk christianity that wasn't your core mission you were just going through these streets as a la -di da hell bound however generally just kind of cool dude but now you're like a blasphemer of monumental proportions because the devils in you are at such exquisite loggerheads with the kingdom of heaven that when they encounter these fly feet with these fly shoes i mean yo i mean what like what yeah when 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 these fly golden shoes because in heaven they're golden like they might not be much here on earth, but I kid you not, my, my shoes are fly. When you encounter these fly shoes, yo, now you're going to be trying to burn them, especially considering you don't get plastic. But uh, yeah, my shoes might be plastic on earth. Like, bring a matchstick all up in this girl and honey, they're gone, okay? But like, <laughs> they're fortified in heaven. They're made of like some material that can't burn. It's it's all it's all strong. <laughs> it's all titanium or something. Like, in heaven, my shoes are made of like real diamond. Right now, you're just looking at these simple looking ones here on earth, but treasure and jaws of clay, make no mistake, my shoes are diamonds. Giving Cinderella Archer a run for her money, not glass, diamonds. Those are my shoes. Indestructible, only thing that can cut it is another diamond. Hallelujah. But right here on earth, like I said, treasure and jaws of clay. We are treasure and jaws of clay. So our plastic looking shoes are actually underestimated until you discover when you wear your spiritual goggles that Chicky be actually wearing diamond shoes. Uh, what mm. but the devil can't stand those diamond shoes because those diamond shoes can can cut out a heart of stone and replace them with the heart of flesh we are just evangelizing nicodemus we are just evangelizing some lost folk we are just helping people recognize that uh, uh this is not going to end well mm -hmm. we help people understand that okay okay so you're wealthy mm -hmm. and according to god's word it is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for you to enter heaven seeing as you acquired all your wealth from the city under the sea because you think you're ariel that's what's good da -da -da -dun 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 -dun. that's you you have not been found nemo everybody looking for you nemo you have not yet been found but what's impossible with man is possible with god Hmm? Here it is that God is able to reach a red, an unregenerate reprobate of monumental proportions because he's out here underestimating. Don't be looking at this looking like plastic. It's, it's golden and it's diamond-like in heaven. It's impressive. It's, it's happy feet like the penguins. Yeah, 
My feet are happy. Mmm. But under estimation, yo, it'll whoop her you with a pama on the side or something. And you're not gonna recover. Type establishment thing. Yeah. Your entities that dwell richly in your bones because you decided to go and burn a house curtain down thinking that the whole house is going to survive. Those entities hate happy feet. They hate those penguins. They hate those golden shoes that even though they look like plastic, they're really actually truly golden. Yeah, but demons are condemned irrecoverably in a way that human beings are not irrecoverably condemned. God is the God of the living and not of the dead. Insofar as you are cockering breath here on earth, insofar as you are breathing some air, yeah, you got a shot, you know what I'm saying? At, at, at redemption, unless you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, which I think a very minuscule, negligible percentage, per, per, potentially even macroscopic percentage of the human race ever has, right? Mm. So much so that many people in the body of Christ can't even agree as to what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so most people, and by most, I mean like quite the gargantuan majority, as in likely even to the 99th percentile of human beings have not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And so most of us are frankly eligible for redemption, know what I'm saying? Mm? Mm -hmm. We we qualify for redemption. And chances are if you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you probably won't even have a desire for redemption anyway. So you're not gonna be sitting outside of Christian ministry all scared, freezing on some oh, I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, it's over, it's over. If you're feeling that way, chances are you're fine. You're fine. A person that has blasphemed the Holy Spirit very highly likely won't even have any interest in God at all. They're probably so reprobate that they keep on spitting on the toes of, of God with hydrochloric acid saliva all the way up until they die. So if you're scared that you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you probably haven't, okay? That's all I'm gonna say for now, yeah. So, seeing as most of us are eligible for redemption uh, and we are still cockering breath and exhaling and all that jazz, seeing as that's like a whole thing that's still going on, it's therefore um, Satan's gargantuan prerogative to unconvince you of the reality of that, to try and keep you as far from the kingdom of heaven as possible and to make sure that you die in that crazy state mm -hmm. to make sure that you perish in those sins when you have like a perfectly viable shot at redemption even though you've done the most like you have done the most you have done the most you're that satanist guy like proper you are ridiculous you're ridiculous you're ridiculous you are ridiculous you are ridiculous sir than ridiculous ever can be you're ridiculous you're ridiculous and so because you're ridiculous you be thinking that you can't be saved, but God came to save the ridiculous. I mean, Saul was ridiculous. He was the chief of sinners, ridiculous. He was just ridiculous, all right? To a point of being given the terminology chief of sinners. I mean, you know you're ridiculous when that's your name. Like when people be out there describing you as chief of sinners, dude, you ridiculous. And yet that ridiculous Saul went to Damascus and despite being crazy ridiculous, an amazing awesome God was like, oh, ridiculous one. Why you keep doing such ridiculous things against my church? You keep hurting me. You're ridiculous. But it don't gotta end like this. A ridiculous one. And the ridiculous one got born again. So if Saul and Ruth Damascus could get saved, where are they who thinks your name is Ariel? Because you're always under the sea, under the sea, in that crazy city, under the sea, you occult practitioner, you. You're ridiculous. Because who in the world chills out of the sea as a human being when you don't have gills? That's obviously wrong. Something is nasty about that activity. You're ridiculous. But God is calling you home. And the fact that you're out of chilling outside of my ministry, feeling some kind of way, evidence is that you have not yet blasphemed the Holy Spirit, no matter how much a ridiculous Satan has out here told you that ridiculously you can't get born again. Bottom line is there is still a shot for you. That's why you are riding me out. That's why you are scared. As scared can get. You're shaking in your pantyhose and in your boots. You are shaking a ridiculous one because you ought shake before a holy and an amazing, awesome God. You should. And the fact that you are shaking, scared, oh ridiculous one, that you're hell bound says that somebody got a chance in these streets. At redemption, look at you, ridiculous. Hey! <laughs> Heaven rejoices even when one ridiculous rando stops being ridiculous. When one ridiculous rando stops being ridiculous, it's a celebration. There's a party in heaven for the ridiculous redeemed and now no longer ridiculous. Y'all don't gotta stay ridiculous. You don't gotta stay ridiculous. It's literally not that deep. It's not that steep. It is easy to turn to Christ and yet it is the most difficult thing that human beings do because Satan makes them ridiculously hateful of God. Y'all be made to hate God in ways that are frankly, obviously the, the work of spiritual manipulation. Ridiculous. So here it is that we're dealing with all these ridiculous people, right? Out just trying to act like they're not going to heaven. That, that there's no chance for them. You're ridiculous to think that way. Why? Because you're sitting outside of my ministry. Like that's all I can say. But Satan makes his servants 
ridiculously like antagonistic like you know the bible says that the god of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers he makes you hate god in ways that are frankly ridiculous and how ridiculous this is 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 especially poignant because there is no other hatred more exquisite than the hatred of the world of jesus and his name no other religion wins that level of fever of antagonism from the global citizenship we are the ones whose god's name is forever just being thrown in these streets blurted out as an obscenity blasphemously so spoken of in vain we are the ones who keep on getting marked at the olympics marked at the commonwealth games marked at basically anybody that can just throw an obscenity an obscenity at heaven they're throwing it we belong to the one true god because satan makes the world ridiculous against our kingdom do you know what i'm saying satan makes the world ridiculous against the kingdom of god y'all and in so making y'all's lives ridiculous then causes you to essentially condemn yourselves further because the closer you were to the light the more ridiculous will be your eternal torment frankly a holy god is going to judge you more richly when you were closest to the light so satan has has a way about obsessing occult practitioners with christians one because he's always trying to be all up in our hair like a tick i mean that's a thing right the devil is always going to be attacking the body of christ but largely uh what is the main prerogative when occult practitioners work so feverishly to fight the body of christ is to condemn them more exquisitely i mean they're already condemned because if you have not embraced the gospel of the lord jesus christ you're condemned already they're already condemned but because of being close to the light their condemnation is that much more exquisite never mind being close to the light like living in a country like south africa but over and above being close to the light you also are an active participant a mutineer um you know against the body of christ when, when you go out of your way to persecute christians you are you gonna burn in an as you know a special segment of hell that that's that much more poignant that much more you know um extreme so first it is rejecting the gospel at all so you're condemned already and then it's rejecting it in a country where it's always being preached so you're super close to the light and then over and above it you go out of your way to persecute the true church you are just leveling up in heaven and not in heaven in hell you're literally leveling up in hell you are moving from one layer of torment to another that is worse and worse and worse getting closer and closer to wherever it is that satan is going to be burning forever yeah when you persecute the body of christ you basically make your eternal condemnation similar to that of satan very close to satan mm, very close to satan and men and women in the occult you are by far the most exquisitely used randos in these streets of earth against the church because the devil possesses possesses you so exquisitely with entities in your body yours that you are more like puppets on a string than anybody else ever can be you are more readily usable your faculties are a lot less available for you to do rather what is appropriate you are just dragged like marionettes like mindless drones to do the bidding of satan you're given affections or emotions sentiments that are so extremely hostile to the church of the lord jesus christ that you make for the perfect saboteurs you make for the perfect abusers of christianity so you will do that which is obviously bizarre <laughs> um to to, to 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 christians in a way that other people that aren't involved in the occult will look at you on some like this person is is extreme she really hates christians my goodness like at a height that is incal incalculable like you, you can't understand why all toile in particular out of all other religions i mean proper religious people can annoy you their dogma can annoy you in whatever f fact or sphere of religious society that they might find themselves in religious folk can annoy a secular human being an atheist anybody at all that is uh, non-religious can be annoyed by religious folk they can be boring and annoying and dogmatic but the hatred of in particular christian religious people will be inordinate in ways that are observable felt seen quantifiable empirical empirically measurable yeah such that everybody on the periphery of you on the left and on the right will make this observation and be like yo this person the way i'm like this person the way she so does not want christians i wonder what they did to her and when then you look back at what it is that has caused this christian to have so much beef with you or you to have beef with them you cannot even see why the inordinate amount of hatred is where it is that it is at it is not like this christian killed your daddy your whole family it is not like this christian you know uh stole your future like you can understand why for instance a jew would have a severity of beef with everybody that's nazi especially if they were still alive in the days of hitler because of the ptsd of having observed your whole family be thrown in a gas chamber and 
exsanguinated, extincted from the earth. When you have an, an extreme loathing then of all things Nazi, maybe even to the extreme of extending it over to all things German, just blanketly applying Nazihood to every German in these streets, unfairly so, um, to highlight when you have that kind of an extreme resentment and loathing of somebody, sometimes people can understand where you're coming from because after all, you were a little girl at Auschwitz when, when Hitler was at the height of his insanity. So your extreme intolerance of Germany and, and Nazism, even though really you need to recover because not every German was a Nazi, we can see where you're coming from. Do you understand? Sometimes it is understandable why certain people are a certain hateful towards other certain other people because of like some trauma. But the hatred by occult practitioners of the body of Christ is not at that scale. There tends to be nothing that you can um, identify, spot, account for as to why such an exquisite hatred. You cannot find it. Literally, you can't locate it. This person didn't steal your boyfriend, your girlfriend. This person didn't kill your mama, your dog, your cat, and your two cows. This person does not have a history of having destroyed you in any way. They tend to be completely innocuous. Just like it's written in God's word, uh, when Christ was describing what is going on in these streets concerning those who are giving him grief, he says that they hated me without cause. It's otherwise known as gratuitous violence. It is unwarranted. Just a hatred of something merely because of the ideologies that it, it, it um, the ideologies, sorry, that it, um, it promulgates, right? It, it purports to stand with just because of their dogma. You hate them. The way that you would hate the guy that kidnapped your family, killed them, killed all of them in front of you, left you for dead, but you survived. Yeah, they hate Christians at that height. In Gati, we actually did something. You would thoroughly think that we did something to them. You would imagine that there is something that happened in some history that can account for this guy's insatiable loathing of the body of Christ. And there tends to be nothing but the fact that from one point to another, they transitioned over from Christianity to the newfound religion. They deconstructed Christianity and now found themselves in this space. People, when they join the occult, they're made to renounce Jesus. They're made to renounce the Bible. They're made to renounce their grandmother's faith, their upbringing, what it is that is their viewpoint, their Christian viewpoint of the world. They're made to renounce it. And then they're given entities, right? Volumes of them that map their renunciation of Christianity to now the emotions that follow suit. Like when Christ redeems us, it is written in God's word, the whole redemption process. I love how Paul Washer explains it. He uses, is it that passage in, I think it's in Isaiah, I stand corrected, but it, it reads something along the lines of, I will put my spirit in you and you will be clean. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I actually want to look for it. It's in Ezekiel 36 from verse 25. Where am I? Okay. Alrighty. Let me read from 24. Actually, it is written. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, not Isaiah. 20, 36 from verse 24. When the Lord redeems us, this is what happens. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Okay, that is Ezekiel 36 from 24 to 27. Uh, Essentially, the redemption process. Yes, this is speaking about Israel, but this is how redemption generally works uh, for everybody. God sprinkles clean water on us so we can be clean. He puts his spirit within us. He makes us love and adore his precepts. He makes us love that which he loves and hate that which he hates. Necessarily, therefore, the opposite must be true, seeing as the devil is trying to be an antagonist to all things God. When the devil indwells a person, when devils, when demons, when fallen spirits indwell an individual, the very opposite happens. Or rather, this happens, but in the opposite light. In the sense that, let me just try and read this from a, sense of, from a vantage point where the devil is not taking a person over. Right? From 24. For I will take you from among the righteous and gather you out of all countries and bring you into my kingdom. 
that's Satan speaking, right? Then I will sprinkle filthy water on you and you will be filthy from all of your cleanliness and from all of your and, and towards your idols. I will uh, draw you, right? So he will draw you to filthiness and he will draw you to idols. A new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will give you a stonier heart than the one that you already have that it might be really hard for you to ever get a heart of flesh and I will give you essentially wicked sentiment. I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them and you shall okay yeah that's up to there so basically satan rocks up and does the opposite you are born already dead in trespasses and sins and in sins did your parents conceive you the devil goes on right ahead and rides that wave and he will make your heart even stonier than it already has been already to a point of being pulverized all right he will give you emotions that apart from demonic worship you never would have had them you would never have been this extreme against christianity against the body of christ you you would never have ended up that extreme he will give you new idols you will worship all different kinds of other extra spiritualities and with the new affections that he has given you because of putting his spirits inside you you will develop a malevolence of being you will be so evil so diabolical and you will have an, an especially exquisite hatred for the one true god and since the one true god is the god of the christians you will therefore of course have hatred towards christians and there will be nothing to account for why you hate them so much they will not have murdered your babies. They will not have taken your girlfriend and your wife. They will not have stolen your lunch at school. They will not have bullied you. There will not be any history to account for why, to explain essentially why you are so resentful, why you can't stand us. Like proper, you will hate Christians in an inordinate fashion that doesn't make sense. And you will tend to also listen to this. Many of you have come from upbringings where you were Christian. You were raised in Christian households. Your mothers and your fathers raised you up in the admonition of the Lord. Your grandmother was a Christian, blah, blah. You were taken to church as a child. And it will be the fact that you were made to renounce Christ it'll be the fact that you were made to renounce Jesus that is going to make you defensive you will be extremely guarded and defensive against anyone raising a Christian flag because here in last deal you're without excuse right Romans 1 the invisible qualities of God are all over creation so you know God exists your conscience speak volumes to you again in Romans 1 it says that not only do you know that the things which you are doing deserve death not only do you continue to do them but you also praise and uplift everybody else that is out in these streets doing them so you have an acute awareness of the wrongness of your sinful nature of your sinfulness and of your sinful acts you have an awareness of it but you're in denial about the God of your grandfather and your grandmother the God that um, was communicated to you will send everybody that is, that is an unbeliever to the flames of hell you are in denial about an inevitable hell that you are going to and you want to eliminate it from the face of the earth you want to deny that it's a thing and so because you want to deny it you then go to so much war with it to debunk a reality that is undebunkable that you then literally make exquisite war with everybody reigniting that message anybody that is out here reconfirming readmitting reacknowledging rehashing the same stuff you heard growing up over and over and over and over and over again. You will do everything in your power, everything to disprove them. And when you are defensive against a truth you know, that's when you become violent. You become murderous. You become ilangalinga shoni. You become homicidal. You become the bane of the church's existence. You hate them because you grew up among them. You hate them because you abandoned a truth you know deep down inside is true the law of god is written on your heart you have got eternity written on your heart you have got everything you need in order to live a life in godliness and yet you chose darkness and you imagine that by simply making extreme war with the body of christ you can somehow if you win that war eliminate the, re the reality the veracity of an eternal god that is omnipotent that no one can be delivered from the hands of an eternal god that created you that called you when you were still a child that you for a season appeared to be keen on humoring but that you at some point in the acquisition of your desires turned your back from and in order to relieve yourself of the disquiet of doing that you then make a, a, a mission out of humiliating christianity you go out of your way to debunk it because you walked away you go out of your way to debunk it and that's the kind of stuff that causes you then to be very violent against christians you are not so much fighting us but the god that you walked away from 
because you want to slap them out the way. You want to eliminate the veracity of eternal condemnation. The lake of fire with a worm dieth not, and in that place there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of eternity. You don't want to uh, reconcile your mind to the fact that that's where you're going. And so in that very heavily prideful state of denial, you are literally going out of your way to kill Christians so that you can give yourself a, a false confirmation, a self-fulfilling prophecy essentially a confirmation bias that there is no place like hell and that the, the god of the bible is not the only way the only truth the only life a truth you know you are going out of your way to debunk it because you were made to renounce it the entities in you that have been cast out of heaven they have given you those emotions that spirit that has hardened your already hard heart of stone that those spirits that have made a, an existing idol you were already an idol an idolater but now you're like an even worse off one you keep on fetching more and more gods at your own peril while God is jealous for you. The God of the Bible, the God of heaven is jealous for you. And a God that is jealous for you will not tolerate you out here roaming these streets with some idols. And you are made to fetch more and more of them. Well, they will give you their sentiment. Just like God puts his spirit in us and we become clean. He sprinkles clean water on us and we become clean. He gives us a heart of flesh while before it was stone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you then get a harder one. Like I said, to a point of even pulverization. Like, you are actually getting a powdery heart that, that's just now irrecoverable. Recoverable. Satan's mission, prerogative, him and the fallen ones, are... Their mission is to send everybody else to where it is that they're going. They're bitter, do you understand? They're bitter about their eternal condemnation. And so they're trying to grab as many souls on earth as possible and dunk themselves in molten lava with them all. Like dunking some, you know, donuts in some chocolate. For all of eternity, he's trying to take all of you there. And so he creates in you these sentiments, these sentiments that are apart from you. You are extreme, y'all. Like that's what I'm getting at. Like you hate Christians in ways that are incalculable, unfathomable, and frankly unexplainable. There is nothing to account for why you hate them so much. You cannot understand why. Because ain't nobody out here in these streets out here committed genocide against your family. We, we haven't done that. We haven't done anything so extreme so as to warrant an understanding as to why you can't stand us so badly. So y'all need to then gaze upon all that extreme hatred that you have for Christians, Christianity, the God of the Bible and all that jazz. You need to invest it, investigate it. You need to look at it as with a magnifying glass and peek, you know, carefully into it. You need to peek carefully into it, you guys, to realize that I have got inordinate affections or lack thereof. I've got inordinate hostilities in like compared to Many of my enemies, I inordinately hate Christians in a way that is unaccounted for. Like, I can't explain why. I don't want them, but I don't know why so extremely. The hatred is gratuitous. It's what I'm getting at. It's unwarranted. It is unseemly. It is full of apathy and it is also homicidal. You get made people that you frankly weren't initially. You get given brand spanking new personalities. You know how God gives us his affections? When you come to Christ, you were once before this mean-spirited rando, but now you are convivial. You're kind, you're sweet, you're nice now, hey? Everybody ought to be feeling you. Because, hey, man, God was, it's nice. Like, she's good, man. Mm, she's good peoples. But, like, last year, yeah, she will pounce on you. She was moody. She was this and that. And now, obviously, the new spirit within her has renewed the lady, and now she's sufferable. Now see, I'm tired. She's, she's likable. She's palatable to our taste buds in a way that she just wasn't historically. Yeah, similarly too. You also become insufferable in a way that historically you were sufferable. So historically you were good peoples and now you're not. Like you are not. You are so not good peoples that you are like homicidal. Like I said, you are just walking around like Freddy Krueger with some knives in your hands. Whenever it is that somebody raises anything at all about Jesus Christ, you hate Christ in a way that is unexplainable. Given that your grandmama loved him. Given that your mama loved him. Given that at some point you claim to love him. And given that he ain't done nothing to you to account, to help, to help everybody understand when's the deadline, why? Nobody can get it. Your affections or lack thereof, your hostilities are inordinate in comparison to how you used to feel and also in comparison to everything else that's ever hurt you. You don't react that badly to everything else. That's the devil. And when the devil has given you those kinds of affections or lack thereof, hostilities, when he's given you that kind of cray cray mind and a cray cray heart, when he's made out of you ridiculous, like I said earlier, when the devil has made you that cray cray ridiculous, 
against body of Christ uh, and members and Christ himself and uh, all things heaven when you blaspheme the, the legions of heaven when it's your oh, job to just always just be bashing your fist at the sky yo dude when are you ever gonna come out of the lake of fire where the worm dieth not and in that place there is weeping and gnashing of teeth for all of eternity and the smoke of your torment rises up forever and there is no rest for you day and night when when you ever gonna get out of that fire when 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 well I mean really that is the prerogative of Satan isn't it he is trying to send you there by making you inordinately hate your maker, your daddy, yo. He is your creator. You should love him. You should adore him. Like a fat kid loves cake even more than that. You should really, really love God. And yet you don't. He is your maker. Yo, dude. Like, who has ever given you an entire planet to live on? Who? Nobody but God. Your mama can buy you shoes. Your mama can buy you a house. Your mama can buy you a cell phone device. Your daddy can out you be building a swimming pool because you like to swim. But your daddy ain't never given you an entire planet. Like, your father has never given you, like, a, a whole beating heart. A thriving set of nuances, a personality, a way of thinking, an ability to enjoy good food. Like, yo, <laughs> God gave you the earth and all that is in it to fill it, occupy it. He in and of himself, after fashioning it, said, it is good. And then built you so you can live on it and then have dominion over the animals. He gave you authority over all of earth and said, run it, yo. He gave you wives as husbands and husbands as wives. He gave you the pleasure of enjoying family and bride meat. Like all that jazz. Like he gave you all that. Like whatever it is that your mama and your daddy can give you are secondary to what God gave you. Because frankly, even your mama and daddy couldn't give you that swimming pool unless God gave them the ability to not only exist and therefore create you as a zygote following which you would then be born as a baby only for you to develop a love of swimming that he gave you in your heart and your mom and your dad to recognize that that's a thing and then build a swimming pool in the backyard from the money that he provided to your mom and dad to provide for you like he is the source of all provision including the doting loving mom and dad that built you a swimming pool because you are a star athlete do you understand what i'm saying who gives you that and then does not receive Adoration, respect, and appreciation later. Hey, y'all be playing out here in these streets with your God. Y'all be playing, y'all, y'all be playing out here in these streets with your God. Y'all be playing games with your maker. Y'all got some problems. And then you go and you love Usata. Yeah, occult rituals vibes much. Because you are upset that Cassandra's racist. And after enough people hurt you, you now are hurting everybody else. Hurt people hurt people. And then you decide that you're gonna show Cassandra Ilanga Linga Shoni. Tell yourself you're going to teach Cassandra a lesson in racism. How it is that you don't treat nobody like that no more. Hmm? You're going to teach her a lesson. And so you kill Cassandra in a human sacrifice ritual. Or you cause her to lose her job. Or her, she keeps on miscarrying every pregnancy that she has. Because you, are, you, you have it in for her. She's hurt you. And now you are hurting her back. And you are using spiritual means. And every time Cassandra comes home all bereft with her husband. Because she miscarried yet another pregnancy. You're sitting in your house. <laughs> You're laughing you're laughing hmm? your god is your belly you glory in shame like you glory in shame that's what it's written in god's word their god is their belly and they glory in shame they rejoice and find glad in that which is a travesty and an abomination to the god of the universe and your consciences start to get seared because you've got these demons inside your bodies sufficiently enough to not even feel sad that cassandra keeps miscarrying pregnancies like proper you don't get to take matters into your own hands you don't get to handle cassandra's racism by doing that to her god will deal with cassandra if cassandra does not give her life to christ and repent and realize that uh, -uh this thing is not going to work you can't keep being so racist against black people if cassandra does not wake up and snap out of that she will meet with the full wrath of god let vengeance belong to jesus christ and him only right vengeance is of the lord but when you take matters into your own hands you be out your <laughs> priding yourself in a woman's sorrow priding yourself in cassandra's pain yeah but if you had left cassandra alone she would have gone on to have her babies with her husband and whatnot gotten old and you would have totally forgotten about her you literally would have forgotten about her maybe one day in the future in 30 years you might be like oh i used to live next to opposite this name this neighbor lady that couldn't stand uh, african people i wonder if they let's a guy but that's it like that's it when you're reminiscing maybe you might think about her again remember her and even then not with pain but with asia we passed it and now we are in better state we are fine like hey i hope she's healed i hope she's taking medication for her disease yeah that, that's how you deal with with past hurt you tend to think back on it nostalgically on some hey i used to live opposite this very racist neighbor here not trying to the abc but it does not hurt anymore does it like even when you recall things that people have done to you in the past like the guy with the road rage incident mm, you don't think stiffly and harshly about them anymore because you have healed you have healed like i had like I, i'm thinking about road rage right now because there was once a guy indeed when i was on my way to work 
that he, he thought that I was Miss Daisy in traffic. He just imagined me super slow. And, I came on and so he not only ran, he, he cut in front of me. I was like, I don't care. But then after cutting in front of me, he then did break. And I almost hit him at the back. And I was so frazzled. I was already born again at that time. I was so frazzled. I was so hurt. I literally burst out into tears in traffic. All the way driving to work, I was like, get on my mean and everything. And then, of course, I calmed myself down, went to the office, told the colleague, yes, it was just random in traffic. And we spoke about it for like 15 minutes, following which I had my first meeting, second meeting. By the afternoon, I'd forgotten about that guy. By the next day, I wasn't thinking about him. And now today, when I recall that incident, when I think about that guy, I'm no longer as emotional. The, at, at the time of the occurrence of the incident I was emotional, I was bereft And I went and I spoke about it at work Ugh. But now, I remember that there was a dude that hurt me Big time He did me dirty He made me cry for the rest of my journey to work And made me speak about him for longer than I should be speaking about a stranger I don't know With a colleague But then afterwards, literally within just a matter of hours I was over him And years down the line I can talk about him without being triggered emotionally most life events most of life events that are hurtful are not triggering that way yes you get the extreme ones where it's like a multi-vehicle car pile up where your whole family died that can trigger you into some tears but most of life's indiscretions like a boyfriend dumping you like a person cutting you in traffic like a person swearing at you uh, or calling you the k-word in racism or a person uh, out here being rude towards you at the mall shoving you most of them do not trigger so much ptsd that you will cry over it most of them are like yes i admit that there was this one crazy dude at clear water mall that shoved me until i fell on the floor yes me that sang at that guy oh my can we king and then you just move on most of them are not triggering that way because god has given us an inbuilt shock absorber the lord has has made us as human beings to be able to just conquer pain at that extreme level until we get over something that was supposed to basically just take us out. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So seeing as most of us have got this beautiful, excellent shock absorber and most life events that hurt tend to not be triggering events in the future. They tend to not be so extreme in the capacity to cause us to mourn over what happened back then. Seeing as most of life events are that way. You can see, therefore, just what a lie it is from the pit of hell that you need to take out revenge on everybody. That you need to take out revenge on ex-boyfriends, goodness. Like, especially the one with, with, with lovers, right? with exes like these people so fade into the background as time progresses they fade so beautifully they fade like eraser you know like when you have written with a pencil on a page and then you erase it you can still see the words there that they're still there right you can see that you've written it's not completely gone altogether but it is just so faded that it doesn't have impact anymore you can successfully write over it right without anybody reading rather what was behind the uh, the, the the uppermost thing that you wrote with an eraser the uppermost thing that you wrote will be what people will always read people will always read what is on top even though it's clear that you had written underneath so yes you've got exes but people will always only ever really just kind of relate to you as your husband is involved in the picture the man in the room at present in your life will be the one that everybody's looking at and the one that you also in and of yourself are looking at while however there is a memory of everybody else underneath that's how ex-boyfriends fade at the time when you broke up, you were so bereft, you were so grieved, it sucked so bad that you thought you could never overcome. But by the time you meet something in the future else and time heals, they fade into the background, just whispers of them exist. So to go and bewitch an ex-girlfriend for dumping you or an ex-boyfriend for dumping you is bizarre, given that if you had just let life course its way, they would have just faded like erased writing on a paper. Visible, you will remember them. Every so often they might be nostalgia, but goodness, largely it's just your husband, Archie, that's reigning and ruling. He is reigning and ruling in your mind, in your members. He is the one that is here now. And that's the one that everybody is also paying attention to. Even though your mom might have liked your ex-boyfriend proper, here is the dude that is now Mkwanyana Wakon. And so that guy from the past will always be the guy that Garabo dated in high school. So to be with your exes is, is bizarre, y'all. It's bizarre. Given that you are supposed to move on. It should be a figment of your past memory. And yet you have made it forefront and center by bewitching them and so therefore surveilling them as monitors you have kept them stark and bold on the pages of your life that you have written them in and made it impossible for you therefore to forget and that's why you develop all these obsessions later on in life that's why as witches you can't move on from my, my ex -in. there's no way you're going to be able to move on from an ex-boyfriend that you have held hostage with witchcraft because you're always going to be surveilling them you're going to be going back to the drawing board to remember them you're going to be conjuring up all different kinds of nasty memories at your own expense because of the fact that uh, because why would you forget about Sizwe when you are making sure that he's not getting married 
Why would you forget about him? Because when you then bewitch him, you make yourself a monitor. You make yourself surveil. Poor old Seasway. Let me go use the bathroom and come from a different venue. I'm probably going to go inside the shack. Today's a little bit murky, so I'm not going to be walking up and down the complex.